Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for being the first guest of 2024. When I was reading your bio, I was very surprised and impressed and jealous that you've been documenting it for about 17 years on your blog, you know, which is like, that's so cool. Build a mission-driven business, which very few actually are. People kind of have a mission statement. That's not what I mean. Everyone right. writes one down. That's not it. I mean, really, you have like a bigger purpose or a thing that really, truly is why you did this. So Tom's making shoes, Patagonia with the environment, um, even Tesla with changing the climate through transforming energy. Those are missions, like real mission-driven. That has to come from passion or it's yeah. not genuine. Just be you on the internet. You know, that's how you just grow your influence. I was reading this book by called Invent and Wonder and in which I think Jeff Bezos talks about there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the missionaries and the mercenaries. And you can tell by... Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Build in Public podcast. I'm your host, KP. And on this show, I interview world-class entrepreneurs, ambitious startup founders, creators and builders on the internet who are boldly building the future in public. This podcast is my excuse to take you all on a curious journey to understand, learn, and hopefully be inspired by the worldviews, insights, and stories of these fabulous people changing the world. So far, I've gotten the rare privilege to sit down with incredible guests like Gary Vee, Alexis Ohanian, Kat Cole, Sahil Levingia, and many more leaders. So check out the full podcast listing at buildingpublicpodcast.com. Now buckle up and get ready for our latest episode. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for being the first guest of 2024. All right, let's go. I'm really honored to have you here. There's been quite a buzz on Twitter, you know, since you announced, I mean, since I posted about a couple of weeks ago, I think, and even today I got a couple of DMs. Mac Martin, one of my close friends, was saying like, I'm excited for this interview. So I'm excited. Looks like you're ready. But as I was saying earlier, I kind of want this to be a curious exploration of, of your journey as a founder. You know, and I, when I was reading your bio, I was very surprised and impressed and jealous that you've been documenting it for about 17 years on your blog, you know, which is like, that's so cool. I wish I would, you know, I think I'm doing it for the last three or four years, but it's amazing that you've kind of you kept writing long form content for a long time. So that's awesome. I want to start with the first question, which is how does writing feel to you? Like, how do you keep up with writing when a lot of people think writing is a very tedious and cognitively heavy task? Well, it is. A lot of things in life are like that. I think even if you're in a band, and you're practicing that, it can be tedious and maybe cognitively heavy. Certainly writing code. I mean, yeah. everybody that loves it, like yeah. me, a lot of it is yeah. tedious and it certainly occupies a lot of your brain. So yeah, of course it is. It's hard. A lot of things that are worthwhile yeah. are hard. For me personally, I get a couple of things out of it. One is I get to try to almost like chew the mm. cud on my mm. ideas or thoughts or the things that we do, whether that's like a, a framework or a process or, a, or some kind of thing that we developed at work or if it's just something that's in my head, I think writing forces you to figure out like, wait, what is this? Um, you know, in the usual way that teaching someone else may means you have to really understand it and all that kind of stuff. And so you get that personal benefit. So yeah, it is tedious and it's a struggle, but one of the things you get out of it is just, what do I think mm -hmm. about things? And do I have any new ideas at all? Or maybe even it's not that new of an idea, but I have a way of talking about it or, or um, communicating it or thinking about it or applying it, which is maybe a little bit new. I think that counts too. And so early on, I was just learning how to get better at yeah. writing and I didn't know what I was doing and I would copy a lot of styles I would see. I would see other people who I thought were really cool at writing, whether it's like copy blogger at the time or James Altucher, who was popular then and, and it was really irreverent or like Seth Godin who would write uh, little tiny sh like uh, miniatures, but they were, you know, each one was just had this nice little ring to it. And, and so I, I would try them on almost like clothes. What about this style? What about this style? Of course, eventually I found my own voice, right? Which was none of the above, but it was, it was whatever, you know, but I don't think that's bad either to just say like, I mean, cause if the question is how do you do it or how do you get into it or whatever, you know, you just, you, you start by anything, including even copying, not copying the words, but maybe the style or this, that. In fact, there was one even where I wrote about the fact that I was copying on purpose to learn and did it in the style of the person I was saying I was mm -hmm. copying and tried to even copy the form that they wrote in for that. And it was kind of neat, but also wasn't quite right. And, and that's fine. Anyway, so over the years, I, I, w I wouldn't say I documented the path. Like I, it, it's not a timeline. It's not news. It's not like here we tried this and this did or didn't work per se. It, again, it's more like ideas or frameworks or processes or uh, sometimes it's just observations about psychology or stories from that kind of thing. And uh, just anything that was on my mind and, and seemed useful to get out this way. And then another benefit for myself is, 
this is now it's now easier to recall and use any of these things because I've spent so much time on each concept. And then yet another benefit is ego. If I publish something online, even one person says, oh, this was great. And that feels really good. And that's a perfectly valid reason to right. do anything. <laughs> uh, I mean, not doing evil or bad things, but I mean, as long as the thing yep, is fine, you know, cool. um, that's not yeah, a bad yeah. reason to, to receive that is not a bad reason to try to do well and put it out there. And I definitely do it for that reason also. Yeah. Now, what does the current writing routine look like? Do you have an allocated time in the day where you think, okay, 8 to 9 a.m. every morning, I'm just going to sit down and write something or is it more so organic? where you feel like, oh, Wednesday, 4 p.m., you had this thing and you want to sit down and write. Right now, it's it, where I say right now, it's always been organic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm in the mood and I write all day, not usually during the week because uh, <laughs> I got work, but uh, like on the weekends or a break. But it, it's, it's mostly just sometimes it comes uh, and then I do it and sometimes it doesn't. Of course, a real writer has to sit down yeah. and write every day. I guess you could debate whether that's true, that statement is true or not. But I think it's roughly true and certainly it's, it's uh, commonly said. So, but fortunately, this isn't my business. I don't make any money on it. I don't want to. I don't have to. This is strictly for me and all those reasons we just said. It's for those reasons specifically and no others, not for making money, et cetera. So that means I don't have to apply myself every day and make sure that a thing comes out here. It, I have no restrictions yeah. on it because it's just right. for me. Did you do a 2023 review at the end of last year or do you do reviews? Do you, do you believe in that? No, I don't do any things like that. I don't make top 10 lists. I don't do reviews. Because I was going to ask you, that was a prompt that, no. you know, kind of help you. I don't use problem. prompts. Yeah. <laughs> I don't use prompts either because I'm not, I'm not trying to fill, first of all, I'm not trying to fill space yeah. or time. If I don't have something that I think is good and new to say, you're like, um, or yeah. at least in a very new way, in my own way, I'm simply mm. not going to do it. If that means I write more or less or longer or shorter, some of my things are uh, a 30 or 40 minute read in one article and some are a three minute read. It's whatever. It's whatever I think. If I have a lot to say and I think it's really good, I'll, it'll be long. If I think I have a short amount to say, that's what I'll do. I'm not trying to fill a business yeah. book, you know, arbitrage, pad it, right? So whether it's uh, when do the articles come out or what is the topics or what is the form, like what is the format? I, I just won't do that. And and I guess it does. It would make it harder to to do this regularly or certainly every day. I don't know how to ever do that. I think you, you probably need more templates and forms to do that. And probably I could have more quote unquote followers or actual subscribers if I did some of these things that work better, you know, probably, but I'm not trying to yeah. do that again. I'm trying to do whatever I think is the best that I can do and put out, whatever that may mean. I don't do any of those things. I'm not, in fact, I, I probably would write a lot worse if it was, oh, use this template and here's the yeah. outline. I'm sure it would just come off as uh, less genuine and less uh, fluid yeah. and organic. So, and uh, I think it'd be harder to, to write. I don't, and that, that's just personal. I, I know people where they could never write like that. They love making the outline first and filling it in. So this is, there's no right. rules here. This is just yeah. personal preference and style straight up. Like th yeah. this is not a law. So for, for me, it's been interesting because I downloaded like four or five templates during the uh, second half of December to kind of write my 2023 recap because it was a big year in terms of so many, you know, highs and lows. And so, but none of those templates really moved to me to start writing. And they felt very much like a, like a gratitude journal, which is like cutesy and not so deep. And so I was like, um, yeah. So I came up with my own prompts where like, well, what were the three things that energized me this year? And I kind of first finished those outline prompts of like six or seven things. And I got excited because of my own prompts because I know the upcoming answer to each. And so that kind of motivated mm -hmm. me to kind of sit down. And it's very hard for me because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm very impatient as a person and restless. It's very hard for me to sit down for like, I don't know, two, three hours. So I did it in two days and then I finished it and I felt so great because back to your point, it didn't really feel that I was doing it as a checkbox or as like, oh, everyone has this template and got to fill this out. I felt like I did it what was authentically, you know, like my reflection of the year. Also purely selfish about like I wanted to pluck out some lessons and keep them top of mind into my next phase of the career. Yeah, so like for me, I, I would never ever write anything like three three things that excited me about this yeah. last year. Again, it's just personal yeah, preference, yeah, yeah. no judgment or anything. It's just not what I would do. Uh, but I, if I did that for myself, that sounds yeah. useful. And then, like you said, you, oh man, that second one, oh man, this, that, the other thing, and ideas start coming. Maybe maybe you even get out a tool like Audio Pen yeah, or yeah. something and just talk, just go blah, 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 and let Audio Pen, you know, turn it into text. And then that text is still not a blog post, but at least now you can sit down and maybe edit or reference that while you write right. something that you're excited about, that you have something to say about. 
maybe with your own scattered thoughts as input or, as, you know, that sounds more, um, more useful, but you're, you're making a composition, just say the thing that's interesting. Like, I guess, um, again, this is just style, but to me, the process behind it or what people, people like thinking on their own, I'm just so not interested. Mm. Don't care. I don't care. Even the stuff like, Hey, so, uh, you're, you done startups. Where'd you get, where'd you, where were you born? How did you, Oh my God, I don't care. Now, a lot of people mm. do care. So again, just personal style, but for me, who cares if you have something interesting or useful or hopefully both to say, just do that as well as you can as my right. style. So let's talk a little bit about the one of the articles that you talked about. You were so passionate about this concept of SLC, which I like. And I thought it was a really nice twist on the, you know, accepted wisdom on MVP, minimum viable product, right? And I had to like really get into what is SLC? What does he mean by that? simple, lovable, and complete? Did I get that right? Right? SLC. And I, I was really interested and I thought, you would be the perfect person and this would be a great platform for you to, for you to double click on that, right? So walk us through what you didn't like about MVP or didn't feel like it was a great sort of a fit to what you were trying to describe and then how SLC is like a better vehicle for the idea. Yeah, so the idea of an MVP uh, or a minimum viable product is that you do something small that you can put out quickly, maybe even two weeks, but okay, two months, certainly not a year, and start to get feedback from customers about it so you can find out right. the truth. And this idea of doing something small and finding out the truth, I like. That part is right. check plus in my book. The reason I wrote that article is because for like the third or fourth time in a row, either by request or I just found the software and it was just complete garbage. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, this is someone's mm -hmm. MVP. And the, what happened is they put out something that was garbage and didn't work and using me as essentially a, a, a guinea pig or quality control so that they can right. learn. But meanwhile, they're abusing me and I'm the customer. Right. And I don't think it's okay to abuse mm -hmm. the customer. Furthermore, I don't think any of us are in this you know, like in other words, doing a startup, making a product because we want to build crappy things and give them and, you know, and right. foist them on people. It's not really right. why we're doing this. D does an MVP, does it supposed to mean that it's bad, a bad product? No, it's not supposed to mean that, but in fact, it often mm. means that people emphasize the M minimum part yeah. and it's not really that mm. viable. <laughs> and the word P product is, is actually, you can throw that away. It's not a useful word. So I just, I thought people weren't, um, it wasn't a good idea, but the idea that it's simple, you get it out there quickly and get feedback. I like what I like. So, so, so I, I had this new way, this SLC, so simple because yes, you do need to get it out fast. And so the product itself must be simple or you won't be able to do right. it quickly and get it out there quickly. Right. So simple. Yes. Dif simple is different than minimum. Now you might say in practice, there should be no difference. And I would say, fine, then why don't you pick a word that means the right mm -hmm. thing? Right. Because minimum does mean something different than yeah. simple. It also can signal like minimum effort. Okay. And so right? simple is the first like one. It can signal minimum but, effort and that is not a great thing, right? Like if you put in the bare minimum effort into something. It, it, yeah, yeah. Like uh, if I said write a poem and you did a minimum yeah. effort, it's not, a great, it's not a great thing. Yeah. If I said do a poem and you write a four word poem that's perfection as they often are in say Latin or maybe a haiku, yeah, yeah. for example, that's simple and beautiful and right. wonderful, not minimum. And a haiku is not yeah. minimum. It's simple. Okay. So they're not the same words. So for anyone that says, but that's what I meant. It's like, well, then why don't you use the right word? If that's what you quote meant. Okay. So simple, not minimum, then mm. lovable. This is the part where we're not abusing the mm. customer. It is possible for a product to not do very much, but you mm. like it. Oh, it doesn't have all the features you want. Okay. That seems like a, like an okay right. thing. Just being bad is not right. an okay thing. Um, so lovable that people should like it. The other thing is a new product's going to have bugs. It's not going to have all the features you want. It's not going to integrate with something. It's not going to support some device you want. Of course, it's mm -hmm. brand new. Like, of course, if the product is delightful or lovable, that helps you bridge that gap. Oh, it also had this one bug, but I like it so much. I'll stick with it. Like it helps you get over the fact that of course, of course it's not perfect. So lovable. And then finally complete. If it, if I can't, because again, I found with these products, I would want to do some task and it could do like half the mm. task. Well, then it's not useful to me. And again, you're abusing me because mm. you made me think that it could do this task and it just can't do it. So complete meaning it's, it's a finished product. It may be too simple and not do enough for a lot of people. Right. That's okay. But if it can do something from soup to nuts so that, mm. it, you know, then it is complete. It's in some simple way. And, and then you're not abuse again, you're not abusing your customer. The other nice thing about complete is you can stop. You might just make a simple product that works right. and you're done. This is especially true if you have an existing mm. product. And if what we're talking about is a next feature or a next component, 
that you're again testing, starting out with it being simple and lovable and complete mm. for some mm. feature, right? You might realize, okay, that was fine and we should stop and move on mm. to something else. Or you could determine, oh, there's, this is a great uh, vein to mine. We should just do way more. We should da, 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 da. And you could, of course, go in and work on it for years and expand what that is, uh, right, into more and more and more. Um, if it's complete, you you have optionality of what to do. Whereas if it's incomplete, as many MVPs are, it's just, it doesn't exist. It's it's a non-starter. And so either you have to finish it or, I don't know, it, you can't leave it because it's yeah. broken. Close the loop, right? Once because... again, people will say, well, that's not what an MVP is supposed to be. And I would say, okay. But it doesn't say that anywhere. Maybe it means maybe viable sort of means that. But again, I feel like people believe, people see viable as the question that the person who makes it is asking, rather than the customer finds it to be wonderful. So, you know, can an MVP mean that? Should it mean that? Yes, it should. That's what I'm saying too. I'm just picking different words that say what I think it actually should mean. I, I also like the fact that your definition is coming from the customer's lens, which is ultimately what, you know, is way more important than just like right. self-serving from the founder's lens. You know, the product that came to mind while you were describing the SLC framework, uh, which is what you just mentioned like a few minutes ago, is Audio Pen. It's actually built by one of my friends. His name's Luis Pereira. I think we, we both follow him, I think, or we know him uh, on Twitter. Yeah, and, and I use and I love Audio it, Pen. Right? It's such a simple product and it's complete in its own right. Like he could extend the roadmap for another six months, eight months, whatever. And then there could be some more additional features, but like on its own right from the first week itself, I think for the first two days itself, it started working, you know, and it's simple and it's lovable. It's got a little personality. He's like put a little care. Yep. And he, I love the fact that he actually, um, he's a no quarter. Did you know that? It was built on bubble, which is insane, right? Like, um, so it's such a great, I think, example for. Yeah. For or um, something like, um snapchat you know it first came out it was this very simple thing you can send a message and it's not saved and it just went from there and then it's a video and then it's it this and then yeah. the stories like it, of course it went on and on and, and added stuff obviously um but at the beginning it did almost nothing but that, that almost nothing was something yeah. people wanted or whatsapp which also yeah. started with literally just you have a status and not even a history, a status. Mm -hmm. And if you changed your status, Google. your friends yeah. could be notified. That's it. And it was really popular because SMS messages are expensive, especially back then they were very expensive yeah. globally. And so this was a way to sort of have a weird broadcasted SMS message for yeah. free. And as bizarre as that is, that was also already very valuable for millions of yeah. people. Of course, it became much more feature rich after that. But that's all it was when yeah. it started. So there's a lot of examples. Those two are from consumers. So fair enough. But um, but yes, like you can you can see this kind of thing evolving. Yeah. So if you reflect on the last few questions that um, a founder has asked you or a couple of, I don't know if you've been to a, a, you know, a meetup or hackathon or whatever, I'm curious about like, what are people coming to you to ask about? Is it product market fit advice? What's been like the theme of some of the questions you've been getting, even on Twitter? In private, people, people are interested in things like, uh, I have an offer to sell the company. I've never done it before. I don't really even know how to think about it. Uh, maybe an offer to raise money is, is a lighter rate version of that. Although there's a lot more information about that, I think available um, on Twitter. Yeah. Sometimes it's uh, how to do very specific mm -hmm. things, you know, Oh man, I'm trying to break into this market. I don't know where to start. Or um, another one that's, that's hard is uh, I've been working on this thing for 18 months. It's not really working. I'm not sure if I could continue working on it or not, which is always a hard yeah. one. I think that one's one of the more difficult things to answer, maybe unanswerable. Yeah. In fact, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's a real toughie, um, especially because getting a year, 18 months in and it's hard and not quite working is the origin story of many successful companies where then it started working. Right. And it's also the story maybe of, failure. and then they, then they worked on it for another 18 months and it never worked. And that was an enormous waste right. of time. And so you're like, well, what's the difference? Because they, they, this seems in common with both. How the hell do I know? the difference and uh, that can be you know it's not i'm not sure i know the answer to that either but um uh that that's a common one how much um i saw in your product market fit article the first item you put on there is like passion right like founder's passion and like actually giving a shit about that particular problem statement or the space how much of that has changed for you do you still believe that's like the, one of the number one first things you look for or like one thing because the, well the, premise the thing to this with passion is, is that it gets um, through i agree in the premise the yeah, i agree time. in what you described but the 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 premise to that question the reason i brought that up is i genuinely believe without actual real passion on that particular problem or customer base mm -hmm. it's very hard yeah. to pull it off and i'm constantly 
having to redirect people who come with this one-off pieces of sound, seemingly sound, uh, smart ideas. They come to me and they're like, here's the niche that no one's looking at. It's just like, what if you just made these military housewives or like whatever, and then they made like a task rabbit for them. And like, I'm like, do you like, you don't care about that? And they're like, no, but it's a huge overlooked opportunity. I'm like, yeah, but there's 7 billion of them. Right, right. Such opportunities, right? Like you have to care. And I think there's a lot of gurus on the internet who are like, oh, here's the 15 niches in a PDF web, uh, Excel sheet that you can monetize tomorrow. And I'm like, that is useless in my view, unless you actually personally care. Well, yeah, there's a lot of thoughts <laughs> yes, here. Yes, I want, I want to hear all, that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So first of all, you need passion to get you through the tough times. Like we said, you're 18 months in, blah, blah, blah. Like something's got to be driving you. So you need some kind of passion about, yeah, the problem or the solution or, or just being here. Or you'll quit and it will never have had a good chance. And that's just not a good yeah. use of time. At the same time, passion obviously is not a business yeah. model. And a lot of people are passionate about stuff that isn't a good business. In fact, that's kind of the problem. They're passionate about the solution and they don't find the problem. Or they're passionate about the problem, but it's not a business. You know, you, you don't know how to find customers. They don't care. They don't have a budget. You're charging the wrong thing. You don't even bother trying to sell because you're just busy making it and you're not, you're not trying to sell. There's all kinds of ways in which you can have passion and not a business. So it certainly can even be a trap, but it's certainly not, not the business. Now, another thing people say is if you're good at something and you dive into it, you fall in love with mm. it. And that can totally be yeah. true. You can fall in love with something as you get to know it and it starts to work and you start to right. make money and, and you fall, you do fall in love with it and you're passionate about it. That right. happens. So it is possible to develop it, I think. At minimum, though, I think you'd need to have a passion for the act of making yeah. a company and wanting to be whole hog in it. Mm -hmm. But it's not guaranteed that you'll fall in love with it. And so it's a risk. It's, now, everything in business yeah. has risks. So I say it's a risk. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that's one of them. I do think you don't want too many stacked up in a company because then it's just unlikely that they'll all come out good. So that just becomes one of them. So for example, if you do have a great niche because you bought one off a PDF and people are buying it, maybe even bought a company that's working so that all kinds of risk about can the product be built? It already is built. Will people buy it? They're already buying it. Ba, 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 ba. You know, all these different risk points are, are solved. And now the question is, will you develop a passion? That is not necessarily a bad risk. Whereas if I don't have passion for it and I'm not sure I can build it and I never talk to a customer, I'm not sure there's a market. It's like, look, how many of these risk yeah. bubbles are you going to accept? Because like the, the chance that all of them work out seems right. real low, doesn't it? Like just seems like right. a bad choice, right? So I don't have like a rule of how many of these things, but like that doesn't sound good. So not having, pa having passion is nice, not having it, and maybe you'll grow into it is a risk and you have to just sort of weigh, is that, you know, is there enough other good stuff that you'll take the risk? Um, and another thing is uh, if you build a mission driven business, which very few actually are, people kind of have a mission statement. That's not what I mean. Everyone right. writes one down. That's not a, you know, I mean, really you have like a bigger purpose or a thing that really truly is why you did this. So Tom's making shoes, Patagonia with the environment, um, even Tesla with, uh, you know, yeah. changing the climate through energy, uh, transforming energy. Um, those are missions like real mission driven. I don't see how that can't be, that has to come from passion or it's yeah. not genuine. You can't just decide I'm going to, and you don't really mm. believe that. If you don't really believe it, then sorry, it's not mm. mission driven. So you don't have to make a mission driven company. Um, I didn't. Smart Bear was not a mission driven because so there's no requirement. Just saying, if that's the kind of thing you want, which it does confer amazing advantages mm. to be mission driven genuinely is quite amazing to do if so that's got to be an existing passion to right. i think because that's what it's kind of part and parcel right. of what it is but again like most businesses aren't and that's okay so so that's fine but that's another kind of place for passion i think where you could say you have to have it on yeah. day one i think yeah i mean i a lot of what you just said resonates with how I think about it. I think fundamentally it's been for me because maybe I'm like so blinded by just sort of like mission driven. Like I'm very like there, I was reading uh, this book by um, called Invent and Wander and in which um, I think Jeff Bezos talks about there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the missionaries and the mercenaries and you can tell by spending time with them. And he said like, I spent time with the Whole Food CEO and like within 20 minutes, I'm like, this guy is mission driven. And again, I don't like actively think about Whole Foods as a mission driven company as much as I think about Tom's or, or uh, Patagonia or Nike, but. Well, I do, but, but they're, but they were founded in Austin. And oh, I, I see, I see. Austin, maybe so that's I why, because I, I don't usually like, shop like a co-op. Yeah. So obviously you have the 
I was I was there when it was a co op where everyone was barefoot and it smelled weird and they're like that's but yeah but what's been fascinating is I think you know when when you are I guess very mission driven I think it's it's very for me it's like you have one life you have one chance you can build the company that you personally give a shit about right why not is how I think about it as opposed to picking the 85th column or a row in an Excel sheet that's like oh it's got a high SEO ranking let's go build something I'm like you know but. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, I mean, so to me, it's it's not even it's not just that it's a company you want to be at. It's more there's this higher purpose right. that you have, and and you believe that through a yeah. company, you can help you can you can be yeah. a part of achieving yeah. that higher purpose. You can help push it along yeah. in some <laughs> way, and it's amazing because you can whether it's uh, employees or customers or investors or etc. For people who are also passionate about that, or at least are impressed and want to be associated with someone who is passionate about that, uh, it just gives you for, for, in all those areas, which is everything, you know, it just gives you this automatic advantage, which especially with things like customers or employees can be a decisive right. advantage for investors, maybe, um, but they have to think about money too, if it's right. not an angel, but, uh, but for employees to want to be there and work extra hard because they want to and, and stay and be loyal because they want to, <laughs> enormous advantage. And of course, customers, I mean, if, if two people have identical products, one has a mission, though, I mean, it's obvious that that can be a genuine, permanent, unassailable competitive advantage. Well, there ain't many of those things in the world. <laughs> so that's, you know, I mean, on, on the other hand, how can you blame someone who says, I work a job or maybe I don't even do that. I want to be independent. I want to make businesses. Maybe my very first business won't be That's Whole right. Foods. Maybe what I'll do is I'll grab something off the list. I'll make a thing. And if I can, if that can mean I'm independent, yeah. if that can mean I can make more money, if that means I can develop these skills while making money, um, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Probably more. Maybe one day it'll be a right. mission one. So is that a bad path or can you say that person is doing right. it wrong or something? No way. Like I, I totally understand right. that. Some people might want a mission right out of the gate. First, first company, you know, I don't want to waste one second on this earth that doesn't have a right. big purpose. That makes sense to me. But also someone that says, no, I want to, you know, I want to make a company become independent, mm -hmm. et cetera. I don't see anything. I mean, it's certainly not ethically wrong or anything like that. Um, and I, it, I, I just, uh, I feel like there's many ways. I do think it's good to be consistent of what you think you're doing and saying you're doing and actually right. doing. Don't say you're a mission driven company. And then your mission is to sell right. towels. That's not a mission. You know, don't do that. You know, just, just admit that that's right. not, that's, what, you know, that's what it is. So I think I, the I do top think to bottom self contradictory right. yeah, things it's, it's, is, is, is counterproductive, is, is actually the, but, but, the top uh, to bottom but, integrity. but uh, it's okay to have a mission or not yeah. have a mission. No, I think that's, that's what I'm saying. Like it's the top to bottom integrity thing, right? Like say the same thing, do the same thing and think the same thing. Right. So, you, you you nailed yeah. it. Tell me about this car seed story that you have, which I loved, by the way. That that whole paragraph, that whole <laughs> it made me think of like uh, my first time in America was in Nashville, and I remember going to Nashville downtown, and like it really was such a such an experience, you know. Like for I grew up in India, and like moving here and like going through the downtown, the buildings, and I'm like, wow, this is insane, you know. And so I love the fact that you. you I mean, I want to actually not not spoil the thing about this for for listeners tell me about what is the car seat story and why are we talking about this like what made you write about it <laughs> when i was a kid uh there was this bagel store uh, that we would get big that was like the one good place in to austin, get bagels right and yeah in austin and so but it was on the edge of downtown and as a kid downtown was this scary place where you never went ever and it, it wasn't that great in the early 80s in austin it was there was crime and it, there wasn't anything there there's no stores no one lived there there were all the buildings that are there now many of them were not there and so uh now of course it was exaggerated in my kid brain <laughs> right but, but still like it was the, right but okay it still wasn't for kids that's for sure so what would happen is we would go down fifth street uh, toward downtown and uh we would stop kind Kind of on the edge of downtown and my parents would go and get bagels then we turn around and leave you know and i knew we were getting there because or we were there because i'd look out my car seat which was on the left driver's side i look out the window and i could see this parking garage that was like this long sloping ramp that went into a parking garage when i saw that brrr, then that's how i knew we were there wp engine is now four floors of that building <laughs> And we have our name on the outside of the building in big light up letters. And so that same building that I thought of as like when I was a kid of like, that's downtown. Like now our name is literally on the building. I loved it. And uh, it's amazing. Now, of course, pre-COVID, we had about 450 people there on a typical work day or weekday. 
Um, now that's not the case. <laughs> People like working at home. So now office space, I guess, means a, a very different thing. But um, that was very, of course, it's really meaningful. Also, my uh, my dad passed away in 2004. And so wasn't alive to see that. And that, that would have been yeah. really great. So that was another thing I was thinking with, as the sign went up. You would have gotten a kick out of it. Yeah. I mean, and, and to close the loop on in this, like this is an article where you're talking about like, when do you know your company is real? And you make a list of, you know, all the bullet points and this is one of them for you. I love that. Okay, so this is the question I keep getting a lot of the times. Um, and I always ask my smart guests this thing because I know that the more perspectives we get on this, the better. Just how do you hunt for a great idea when you're getting started? Let's say a bootstrap startup founders listening to this or when a potential VC backed founder who wants to, the next Amazon is listening to this and they're like, okay, how do I pick a great idea among like 50 ideas? What is your framework? So is the, is, is the question, how do I get ideas in the first place? Or is the question, I ha what you just said, I have 50 ideas, but I don't know how to select between I, them. I think the, more so the latter. I feel like a lot of people have ideas, even if they're terrible. They have like some ideas, like Uber for dogs yeah. or whatever, you know? So this is a high, high, high achieving, this is like very common. I'm sure you, you know, you, this is a very aspiring founder problem where there's a lot of these ambitious professionals and they have five or six ideas and they're like, how do I decide which is a better one? Or how do I even like think about ideation? Well, if, if you can't decide, what that means is on the primary dimension that you care about, they're the same. Mm, yeah. Like if one of them stood out as, oh my God, I love that one. Then well, then you would have gone. Yes. Considering True. five of them. So the good news whenever you're stuck on something like five is like maybe any one of them would be mm. fine. And right away, you can let the stress go level go down a little bit because you realize that no matter what you pick, it's okay. So then you start asking, well, what are those secondary characteristics that I want to I want to uh, do? I think there's a couple ways to approach that. One is what we were just talking about. What is at risk? What do I know versus not know? Well, this idea, I know I could build it. What I don't know is, will people buy it at what price is there? You know, this one, I know the market's there because I don't know, it already exists and so forth. And actually, the risk here is there's already 20 competitors and I don't know how I'll stand out or compete with them with advertising. Blah, blah, blah. So in that way, in that manner, you could look at each idea and look at all these different things. You know, I have some materials on this, but things like the market size and whether people buy, and whether they're already buying and how bad the competitors are. And there's, there's you know, you can get lists of these kind of things on, online or you can think through what a company needs or, you know, I have, I have some of this kind of information on the on, blog, on, right? Yeah. Yeah. On my side as well. And, and, and you could just ask like, which of these things are known and solid versus which of these are sort of unknown, which of these are maybe just bad. There's always some things that are hard and bad. That's not mm -hmm. a deal breaker. It's just, that's what it is. So that when you're looking at them, it's like, which combination of stuff do you want? So which is better? An idea where the market is real and busy, but the competition's high or a market that doesn't seem to exist and there isn't competition, but it's not clear whether anyone would ever buy it. Which one's better? And the answer is no, there's no which one's better. There are different challenges, <laughs> different kinds of risks, different bets you're taking, different challenges. And the question is, which ch do you want? And that still comes down to a personal question, but at least you've identified what the choices really are. This is the shape of the things that will be easy and hard, the risks and the knowns. That's the shape of that one. That's the shape of that one. And you're picking between these bags of risks and goods and bad things. So that's one way to try to analyze it better to, so that you're making a decision with more information. Of course, you could just simply solve for like which one seems most likely to succeed. Mm. That's an obvious one. So again, you can go back to these things and try to add those up in some, in some fashion. You can also ask about emotion yeah. and like, can I see myself still working on this problem in yeah. 10 years? And of course you don't know two years from now, you might feel really differently. So it's not about predicting that really, but just could I see myself doing it is an interesting right. question. Cause some of these might be, like you said, I picked the thing off a list. It's probably a decent business, but God, no, like if 10 years from now, I'm still doing that, I'll yeah. kill myself. It's like, well, then you don't really want to do it at all. Like, why would you spend one yeah. year on it? Whereas something else is like, yeah, I mean, it may not work, but if it did, this could be like my life's work. Okay. That's, that seems like a positive vote. So you could, you could take that sort of long-term, even emotional view that might select one or at least deselect some, you know, that don't qualify there. So you could take that view as well. Another place I always go to, we keep talking about passion, but what about what your strengths are, like your abilities, your experience, 
uh, your capabilities, or maybe what you have access right. to. Maybe you have access to more money, and so you can apply money to things, or you don't, and so you can't apply money to things that's not a strength, and so forth. Maybe you have a network because Twitter, maybe you don't because whatever. So what are these assets and things that you have, whether you're your abilities or things around, and which of these ideas leverage what you have? Right. So like, oh, I'm, I'm great at writing code, but here's a business that uh, doesn't involve writing code. Okay, well, you can still do it, obviously, right. but you have no intrinsic advantage. There's no reason why you should right. do it. You're not going to be a, a especially effective. You're not going to, you're going to have to make mistakes that an expert would never make because you haven't done it before. You'll be slower because mm. you're figuring things out and so on. As opposed to like, look, I'm an expert in X. Okay, well, if you can leverage that expertise in something, you'll be more efficient, faster, less likely to, you know, you'll make higher class of problems and so forth. Or whatever the challenges are in the business, you, at least this will be no problem because that's your expertise. Put that to bed and just work on the other challenges. So if you're not leveraging any of your strengths, they're just, everything's a challenge. Oh, yeah. Everything's riskier. Everything's right. harder. That's no good. Now, of course, this requires you to know what they are, which is hard. It's hard to be introspective. It's hard to analyze right. yourself. It's hard to know what the strengths are. So that's hard. You can try to do it. There's, there's things online that help you try to figure it out. It's often nice to ask other people, yeah. the people, whether your coworkers, family, spouses, et cetera, they know what you're good at and not probably right. better than you. And um, especially if you can make it anonymous, like a 360 often a review is, um, if you can manage that, it's, that can be hard. By the way, maybe an interesting use of AI, people put in their stuff, but use ChatGPT to keep the meaning, but ch take, their, uh, take their unique style completely out of the equation. So it really is anonymous. Mm. That's a fun use of AI to anonymize writing. Like normally it's like ChatGPT's writing is boring and crappy because it's just has no style. It's like, yeah, but for anonymous stuff, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that's, that's good. That keeps, so, that um, keeps us from guessing anyway, uh, who the person wrote that, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe it helps people be more honest. Maybe, you know, it's, it's always hard. Anyway, the point being is if you can, if the more you can get the truth out of other people, the better is what right. I'm getting at, right? So you get an honest assessment of these things. And it'll surprise you because there are things that you uh, feel, oh man, I'm, I always struggle with this, but everyone else thinks you're the best <laughs> right? because that's what it means if you're a perfectionist and you care <laughs> yeah. about it is that it's never good enough right. for you. So you're like, ah, oh. but other people think like, no, this is like, this is amazing. I just can't believe that you can even do that. You're like, yeah, but it's hard and I work really hard on it and it's no good. It's still like, I feel like that. I was going to say, I was going to ask you, what is, what, what? is that? Absolutely. I, I rarely put out something where I think, oh, this is great. I just think like. God damn, I, like this needs so much more work. And other people are like, it's so perfectly written. And I'm thinking like, no, it isn't. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> no, you're wrong. This this one end of this one paragraph, I'm proud of that. <laughs> but the rest of yeah, it, I don't know. You know? Was, so that's how it is. That you, so from an outside, that you, from an outside yeah. perspective, you can you get that and vice mm. versa. There's things you think you're really good at that you are not. I'm good with people, maybe not so much. I know a lot about this. You think you do, but everyone just kind of doesn't say anything and, and uh, actually know. You think you're patient about certain things. You're not. So really, you can get a lot of feedback. And another way you can do this, and, and this is, by the way, if you're interviewing people, uh, or, or sorry, if you're if you're um, if you're doing like a, a a reference call on someone for an interview, right? Um, it, it's hard to ask them stuff because they only say nice things. So it's sort of a, an analogous situation, right? A nice trick for that, which you can apply to this too, is you ask without saying what the culture and environment of your company is, you ask the other person, what is the culture and environment and situation and wow. responsibilities and da, 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 in which you think this person would absolutely crushes mm. it. And they're like, oh yeah, well, they're good at this. So this and blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, okay. And then what would be like their anti-environment? Like, not that they're a bad person or anything or that they're bad, but just if they were stuck in a certain environment, they would, they would be crushed. Mm. They would die. They would be horrible. They would, you know, this, they would be awful. They would act badly. Like, and they're like, oh yeah, well, if this and that, then, you know, it's a safe way for them mm. to say kind of what they're like. And they're, in a sense, their strengths and, and, and weaknesses and how they interact with the world in a way that's safe because they don't know what your company's like. So they don't know how to tune it to you. And it's a perfect, it's a good question. So I like those first follow-up questions like that. And so that's, that's a useful little nugget in itself. But so back to who you are, you could ask people that like it's one step mm -hmm. removed. Hey, what environment do you think I thrive in? Or what environment do you think I, I, I would, I would die in? And it's a nice way for someone else to be more honest than they could otherwise be. Cause they're talking about the environment now, not it's like one right. step removed from you. Oh yeah. You're great. If you know, no one, you hate it when people tell you what to do, even when you're wrong. And so, yeah, you gotta, you know, that's probably true. If you're an entrepreneur, that's probably one of the things anyway, it's easier for people to say that 
um, I think, and tell the truth. And, and, and it's almost like a, a, like a, a mold. It isn't you, but you're, you're the space that that mold leaves behind is, is you. And, it, and it's easier for people to describe the mold maybe, or, or be honest about it. And so you, I think you could use that. So that's just a long way of saying it's hard to figure out about you, but I think you must. And pa yes, passion is one of those things, but like all these other things, that is another way to cleave these ideas. And so all the way back to the ideas, okay, is it a good business or not? Obvious one. What's the risk prof What is the basket of risks that you're taking? And then this question of applying your strengths and knowing what they are and then saying, okay, so which of these are an quote unquote mm -hmm. environment in which I would thrive, you know, that kind of, of trying to apply that. And that might help to say, man, I would just crush it on this one idea because of right. who I am. You know, that nugget around asking someone the environment question, I'm going to remember that and I'm going to take that forward into, you know, whatever I do next. Because I had one similar nugget like that two years ago when I was at Deck and I was hiring, I was a, uh, I was a director and I found this somewhere. I, and somebody advised to me the same way you, you just blurted out in a random conversation, this particular thing that has stuck with me. And it's, it's an amazing hiring question too, which is who would be a great companion for this person to be next to, to be paired to, so they balance their strengths and weaknesses. So you're not really asking, hey, what's the weakness of KP mm -hmm. as on a reference call? Because they will never tell you exactly the weakness because you know they're trying to protect them. But if they say, oh, KP would really thrive with someone who got their ops and organizational strengths together. That's actually true. This is a real example. I'm like, I'm, I'm great big picture thinker and all that. I'm like terrible at the file system and operational thing. So I always had someone who was my right hand person who did that. And, but that awareness has been really helpful. So in, when I did my own company, the first hire I made was an ops person. Cause I'm like, I know that, right? <laughs> right. I got so many people to tell me the truth about applicants by simply asking this question. And what I'm going to do now is ask the second question, which is the culture question. In what environment slash culture they'll thrive, which will also open up another side of theirs, you know? So I love that. It's, it's fascinating. So Jason, um, let's talk Twitter. You're online. You're extremely online. I, I don't know if you're extremely online, but you're as online as I am. Like you're, you use Twitter prolifically. I mean, the benchmark is someone like my wife who opens Twitter once a year. So that's the reference point I'm saying. What do you love about Twitter? What do you hate about it? Or what do you, I feel like I'll tell you what I love about your Twitter is your replies and your DMs and just the way you engage with it is so authentic. And it's like, to me, that's like the benchmark of how people should be on Twitter. Now, it, does it get followers or not? It's secondary, frankly. I, I don't, I could care less, but to me, that's what makes it. <laughs> yeah, it'd probably get more followers if Maybe I did other stuff, yeah, but, like but that, oh well. To me, you know, like that's what our with calls Twitter is like that. You know, uh, Drew Riley, one of my close friends, there's, there's a few that have a really authentic presence and they use it like like a chat chatbot, right? Like a t Telegram or a WhatsApp. I love that, you know? So what is your relationship with Twitter? Like, how do you view it? What's fun for you there? Connecting with founders or what, what is it about? Yeah, so it, it, it looks like I'm online more than I am because I, you know, queue oh, yeah, things yeah. up and they get sent out, right? So I'm not like, yeah. But yeah, when I reply, I always think, um, I mean, unless it's a quick thanks or something, right? Um, I need to add something to the conversation. Yeah. And so I think if you think that way, you know, hopefully it's, maybe it's genuine, but, but certainly it's like worth reading or something. I do think, um, I try hard that everything I put out is something I think is saying something, meaning again, there's a lot of like people just put out a platitude <laughs> and, and sometimes those things go viral, you know, and it's fine. Or so a quote from someone else. All right. It's fine. You know, it's, it's, I guess it's engagement. It's just, you're just not adding anything. Um, so I'm, I, I try to do that. Um, I also have a deep buffer of stuff I put on Twitter. In other words, I don't ever want to be like, oh, my buffer is running low, but I've got to keep posting. So now I have to post crap. <laughs> you know, I don't want to feel that way. So I make sure the buffer is really, really deep so that that's not the case. Another thing I do, another fun trick, I, I don't think I've ever talked about this. It's not a, it's not like bad or a secret. I just haven't, you know, I just don't talk about my processes very much is this. Because as you say, it could take a lot of time. Like, okay, I'm going to take a lot of time to write a tweet. I'm going to take a lot of time to reply. Like this doesn't take too damn long. I double up my time on the replies and new tweets in the following way. Someone says something and it triggers something in my mind, or they ask a question. And, okay. At that moment, I think, Ooh, let me, let me think of a really good answer. And then I will write that really good answer in there and also put it in a draft in the queue. Same text, just paste it in like a draft area, right? So I send the answer right then. But then I have this draft and I rewrite it to be a standalone tweet. Because the answer is often like, oh yeah, and also, you know, because right. there's a threat. So just, so I, it, it's just like, I just rewrite it. Same concept, I don't have to think of a right. new idea. And most of the text is probably fine too. Maybe length, but you know. And I just simply rewrite a little so that it's just self-contained. 
And that goes in the queue. And because my queue is long, that won't come out for a long time. Like so it may months. take like two, three months. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause you, you know, if that person read my instant reply and then saw me like repeat it, that's just kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. Right. But if, if it, but if it's comes out months from now, neither one of us yeah. will remember <laughs> that we did that happened, you know? So in other words, I double it's a up, gift to your future right? self. You know, I, right? I double you of my yeah. time. And so, so it's these like, how do you have time for all these great replies? And it's like, oh, you're right. Except that's also where I get my tweet. I I did. Not every one, but like a lot. I would, I would say like, you know, a third, yeah. maybe even a half come out yeah. of there. Um, it's still me. And like you said, it's still yeah. me and genuine. Cause it's my thoughts yeah. in the first place. Like I, I didn't take it from somewhere else. It's I'm just repurposing this thought. If it's yeah. so good, quote unquote, obviously, you know, I'm, you know, but if it's so great, okay, then why shouldn't I say it again in two months? It's Twitter. If that's fine. <laughs> so, so that's a little trick that doubled my efficient, you know, my productivity, you might say. I, I get a lot of um, similar ideas from just replies and I feel like replies are underrated. You know, one from a engagement point of view, it's good and all that. But apart from just the metrics aside, replies are sometimes when I'm so lazy and that morning I'm like, I'm not in the mood to write something new. Like my brain's not like creatively, you know, open that way. I just look at some smart person's tweet like yours, for example, or Arvid Goss. And I'm like, because, you know, obviously the people I follow, the 10, 20, 30, 40 close people that I follow are smart and they will tweet smart shit. And so I'm like, oh, if a smart conversation is ongoing, Adding to it naturally is intellectually stimulating because you're like, they're talking something really cool mm -hmm. like MLS, MAP or SLC or whatever. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So from my experience, I try to think about, from my experience, this has been a different way and here's my unique take, blah, blah, blah. And that itself is fodder to my original post. And so back to what you're saying. And so a lot of the times, you know, when I'm helping founders with content, like I advise them, they're like, KP, like they're mostly lurkers. And they're like, how are you coming up with they seem to think that there's some magical, you know, way in which I, I, or, you know, I'm not saying me, but I'm like, how do you come up with great content ideas and post them? They come from listening and reading and observing others. And what they skip is they often skip the engagement part because it's, they feel like it's below them, you know? And if you're a big account, you don't engage with, and I'm like, but that's where gold is. Like, that's where the unpanned gold is, you know, in my view. I also personally, I'm a very social person. So I'm like, I love engagement, you know, um, that's been very helpful on Twitter. So, you know, there's, there's an interesting way to do that engagement. So I forget if it was Larry, I think it was Larry page. It, it might've been Sergey, but I once heard this really funny thing they do with email with one of them, which is they're like, look, I get, I mean, other than company email, I just get gobs of yeah. random email. I'm not going to, I yeah, can't yeah. look at it. Right. So he says, so here's what I do every once in a while, I'll open up my public email and I'll respond to the first thing on the list. Like the thing that just came in. And what, the, what happens in this person's uh, words is most people who email me get exactly what they expected, which is no response right. from the right. CEO of Google, <laughs> Google right. you yeah. know, like, right. But there's, but one person will say, oh my God, I emailed him. And literally like 37 seconds later, he responded, the dude is a beast. Like, what the hell is this dude? Yeah. So someone has that experience. And that always stuck out of me as like absolutely hilarious and, and, and actually not, not, uh, not unwise. So apply that to social media and here's what I think you get. So, okay, don't, you know, you don't have to watch everybody all the time, but sometimes open up Twitter and go to your feed or whatever you have of people you're trying to talk to. And just, if someone posted one minute ago, <laughs> go answer it. Right. And it's like, same, it's the same thing. Like, don't do that all the time because that's crazy. But if you do it sometimes, then people will have it in their head. Like that dude is on it. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> so. the other thing too is um, about your content and my content is similar too, is that you are generous in resharing other people's ideas or posts and tweets. And I feel like you just don't have this weird, like, you know, oh, like I think boundaries or egotistical boundaries. Some people, some people you, you'd be surprised. I think you're not in the same circles that I'm in. There are some circles that I'm in, their feed is so manicured and pedicured or whatever cured that is. They're like, oh, KP, this is such a great idea. Oh, I wish I could repost. I'm like, just repost it. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. I'm like, why not? Like, they're like, oh, yeah, because I, I just don't retweet other people's stuff. I'm like, what? Who put this artificial construct that you can't retweet other people's shit? And like, yeah, it's going to mess up my feed for the rest of I'm like, oh, my God, is this your account or are you kidnapped for this? Like, what? Come on, right? And so I feel my favorite account is Gary Tan's account where Gary Tan will just tweet whatever the F that comes to his mind. Same with PG. Like, you just don't know what you're going to get out of PG's account, right? And I love yours. I love it. And so it's like, just be you on the internet. 
you know, that's how you just grow your influence. But if you're after this sort of um, audience building games, I feel like that's just not a, you're not going to do any of these, you know, things because they're like anti-audience building. Yeah, I don't know. Um, again, like I, I'm not trying to do all the things to build a following, quote unquote, and I'm not, uh, I certainly not trying to make money at it. I'm not selling courses and I'm not, you know, and so I don't know, I don't, uh, maybe you do need, maybe all that stuff with the manicured feet, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that's absolutely required. It is. If you do, do the, whatever. if like, you I, want I that mountain, know. if you want to climb that mountain, it is because I've taken some courses and I'm like, this is disgusting. That's why this year, 2024, I feel like I'm coming back full circle to just being completely my favorite posts despite the engagement have been where I was myself and at peak, like at best, you know, and I'm like, even with the podcast, with my Twitter, whatever, I'm like, you know what, this is more sustainable. It's more fun. And I also actually get to build relationships. And that's what I care about ultimately, right? Like when you, what's the point about having 87,000 followers for this 76 K. So, yeah, I mean, I, there could be a point. The point is, uh, you know, you feel more important you do ha you as long as they're not bots you do have a bigger yeah. audience and maybe you want to do something with that audience you want to monetize and all that yeah um, true yeah like so there can be answers so i mean it, as usual in life it goes back to like what are you yeah. trying to do here what are your goals and it's not that you have to predict everything or, and it's not it's, and you can also change your mind so we're not trying to like you know not trying to artificially set things in stone at the same time yeah like either you're trying to build an audience because it's good for your ego or like you said, I want to make more relationships. Okay. Well, that's a wholly different yeah. thing then that you're, that it's you a different to mountain. Too. Yeah. Um, too. So, yeah. Awesome. Anyway, I think we're almost at the end of our, um, our Jason, this has been a blast. I feel like I could go another hour easily, but in uh, respect for your time, I want to say thank you. We'll just do it again. We should, we should definitely do it again. I, um, I'm grateful. For your presence here i'm excited for this year's lineup i have rob walling coming up soon i have uh i have got a couple others like i'm excited for this has been like my theme as i said earlier like folks who i really am excited about i really want to learn from them is who is on the lineup so thanks for your time great to be here awesome i'll let you know when this comes out and for now it's a wrap <laughs>